Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the HPR Chronicles with Shakur and Smith. That's me. Today, we're going to talk about guns, man. Ooh. The history of guns. Christy. Okay. <laughs> wow. And 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 gunpowder too. And gunpowder, okay. Yeah, with all this <coughs> stuff going on with the mass shootings and stuff like that. I mean, we're not going to talk about the negative side of it, obviously, with all the shootings. But mm -hmm. you know, we will bring up AR-15s and all that okay. stuff. But yeah. So yeah, it's a podcast, guys, about history, politics, and race. I was just telling Crispy before the show started that I like that we could talk about other subjects beyond, you know. Just poli uh, or just one politics and mm. countries and you know history as it pertains to race and wars Correct. and I like how we could talk about guns and next week you're going to talk about the wineries here in Temecula and stuff yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. So I like that that we can broaden it out, talk about all kind of stuff. Yeah, so we always try to break it down simple. We we uh, study these topics so we can bring you guys facts. I'm a filmmaker from Trinidad and Tobago. For those of you that are just joining us for the first time. I've traveled a lot. I've always had a love history in politics. And Crispy is a veteran of the Army Reserve that works for the VA. And he also has a passion for history and politics as well. We always say it's about truth. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's not <laughs> about any race. We just try to, you know, give you guys the facts. And if the truth offends you, we're sorry, not, not sorry. sorry. You know? So, yeah, man, that's it. So, like I said, today we're going to talk about guns and stuff like that and have some fun i thought this was a very interesting topic uh chris because years and years and years ago i mean this was probably 20 something years ago okay i heard uh so so first before i tell this story you you may ask yourself what does the moon have to do with guns yeah and i'm gonna explain it right now okay so <laughs> years years and right. years ago I heard Minister Louis Farrakhan tell a story at one of his uh, uh, events. Okay. And he, he uh, spoke about how, how at, at one point uh, the earth and the moon was connected at China. And it shared, the earth and the moon shared water. And when it separated, you know, the, wa the earth kept all the water. Okay. And the reason why we have low and high tides because the moon is is trying to pull the water from the earth. This is what Farrakhan said years ago. Okay. This guys, this has this this has to be maybe twenty years ago. So okay. so when Farrakhan first said that, first of all, I was like, Farrakhan is one of those guys who's well studied, well well like mm -hmm. uh, he's very knowledgeable. He's probably one of the smartest human beings on earth, believe it or not. And that's saying a lot, but he is. I, I get this it. dude. So, you know, when he said that, just knowing his track record back then, and I mean, I'm 46 now. I had to be maybe 20 years old when, when I saw that, okay. 21 years old. I mean, this was 20-something years ago. Mm -hmm. And back then, I really didn't look it up. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So what's interesting about, you know, the study I did for, for today's show about guns, this was my first time revisiting what Farrakhan said twenty something years ago. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Got it. So I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you guys how it all relates. Okay. You know what I'm saying? The moon and guns. Uh yeah. Okay. And and we also know that uh uh gunpowder was found in China. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And Farrakhan said the earth and moon was connected at, at China. Okay. Which is interesting. <clears throat> so in my research I found out that astronauts who visit the moon, whether you believe in that or not, have also said the moon dust smells like gunpowder. Oh, okay. Okay? And, and I quote from Apollo 16, but they did react, it is a really strong smell, quote unquote, radio to Apollo 16 pilot Charlie Duke. It has the taste to me of gunpowder. He tasted the shit? Yeah. And, it, <laughs> and, it, and the smell of gunpowder, too. Interesting. On the next mission, Apollo 17, Gene Carnan remarked, smells like someone just fired a carbine in here. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when I read that 20-something years later, and then Schmidt says all of the Apollo astronauts were used to handling guns. So when they said moon dust smells like burnt gunpowder, they knew what they were talking about. Okay. Now, back 20-something years ago when I first heard that, the Internet didn't even exist. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get you. It was so. To me, it's interesting how you flip twenty something years later, and I had a chance to revisit what I heard Farrakhan say today in my history of studying guns, mm-hmm. and these astronauts are saying the same thing. Same, yeah. Now, I'm not saying the <clears throat> Earth and the Moon were connected at China at some point. Okay. I did kind of research that, and mm-hmm. the Earth, the Moon did derive from the Earth. I did learn that just just looking up how the Moon was created. Yeah. So maybe there's some truth in what Farrakhan said. Maybe. I mean, if, if, if you know what I'm saying, if, if, if you correlate these stories, they seem to meet in the middle. Sure. What Farrakhan said, what the astronauts are saying. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, it's, so, it's, it's, so it's funny. So the funny thing is, as early as 850 AD, mm-hmm. gunpowder was discovered in China, where the Earth was supposedly connected okay. with the moon. It, it was used for fireworks first, then it made its way into guns. You okay. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, first in cannons and grenades, then, then some of the very first guns were made with bamboo tubes with gunpowder and with a projectile in it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Historians think that this was used, to hand, this was used in hand-to-hand combat in the early war days. Okay. So it was basically just a tube yeah. with gunpowder in it with a projectile and somewhere they would just make it you know what i'm saying Shoot off. Okay. yeah so the whole thing is is like interesting mm-hmm. you know so thanks to uh traders like marco polo and i've heard of marco polo but yeah. I, never, I never even knew that he he was a venetian merchant to believe to have journeyed across asia at the height of the mongol empire that's mm-hmm. who he was marco polo mm-hmm. so apparently he traded gunpowder yep you know what I'm saying? From Asia to Europe. Yeah, I remember that in history. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And and it developed into weapons like the matchlock, wheel lock, and flint lock firearms. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So by the time those early uh, colonists of the 15th century arrived in America, they had guns as a part of their travel. Because okay. in the 13th century, they had already gotten the gunpowder and figured out ways to, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So some of the first guns they traveled with was the the German made blunderbuss, which was an early shotgun, mm-hmm. and the uh, and the uh, the uh, matchlock musket. It was called the matchlock because it used a small piece of burning rope to ignite the gunpowder through a small hole in the barrel. And I remember seeing that in like movies and stuff. Yeah. I don't know if you remember yeah. seeing those guns, and it would it would have like that little stem, and it would light it, shh, boom, and then it would. <laughs> so those some of the early mm. guns because they hadn't figured it all out yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some of the early settlers became gunsmiths. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm wondering how many people like lit and it didn't go right and blew up in the face. Uh, I'm sure but quite a few. Anyway, you know? Yeah. They were they were skilled in metalwork and developed the American long rifle, which became known as the Kentucky, Ohio, or Pennsylvania rifle. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. these are the long rifles you would see decorated with brass and silver plates. I remember those. Mm-hmm. Those really fancy ones you yep. see in movies and historic books, and they they be shot. They they they're yeah. shiny with like the gold and metal. <laughs> yeah. They look all brass oh, and yeah. fancy with the patterns on it. Yeah. Those were some of the first rifles. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Which I had no idea. And I've heard of the musket before, but I did, I never connected the history of it. You know, again, which is why I love this podcast. Yeah. You learn so much new stuff. <clears throat> And for me, as a filmmaker, it, it also helps me, too, when I'm writing a script. But, you know, oh, when you yeah, have yeah. that knowledge, you can write with, with a different intent. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it all works. Uh, one of the most important aspects of these long rifles was the twisting grooves in the barrel toward the exit, which created a spiral motion when the bullet exited the barrel, which made for straighter shots, especially when hunting for food back then. Interesting. So, yeah, so that's when they first started putting the swirly grooves in there. Mm-hmm. So when a bullet comes out, it spins. And, and it somehow it just goes straight. Yeah, it goes straighter, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So, so after, after, this came, after this came the revolutionary weapons, which focused less on aim, but more on being able to reload uh, quickly in battle, mm. the the spark used to ignite gunpowder in early American-made smoothbore weapons was actually generated by a piece of flint striking a metal plate or a pan coated in gunpowder. 
A well-trained soldier could generally fire and reload a flintlock weapon three times a minute, whereas the American long rifle, the fancy ones with the shiny stuff, mm -hmm. required a more tightly loaded bullet and generally took a minute to load and fire a single shot. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, so as time went on, you know, kind of like they're saying for for the revolutionary for the revolutionary war and stuff, mm -hmm. they focus less on aim and more on time. Okay. You know, and and which which makes sense because if you're in battle, yeah, By the time I mean, by the time you're trying to load one bullet, your ass and got shot, <laughs> or somebody <laughs> may have ran up and, and, and stabbed, stabbed you. you, right? Yeah. And, and back then it was probably close in range anyway. So they yeah. didn't need to like hunting you away from the animal. So right. back then it makes more sense. So yeah. as time went on, they, they needed to focus more on just quick, forget quick. the aim. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because less which is, which is more crazy. chance, more bullets, probably better chance of yeah. hitting whoever hitting, you're hitting, hitting, hitting the target if you're in war. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So in, in in order to boost the the fledgling nation's homegrown arsenal, General George Washington ordered the establishment of the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1976. At first, the Armory stored ammunition and gun carriages, but by the 1790s, the Armory began to manufacture muskets and eventually other guns. You know what I mean? So following the, following the Revolutionary War, Congress also established... Harper's Ferry Armory in West Virginia in, in 1798 to boost weapon and ammunition production. Hmm. You know what I mean? So this is something like the government did. Congress established this. Yeah. You know what I mean? As time went on... But gun, for, a mili for more like yeah, a military yeah, type use. For more of a military use. As time went on, guns got more and more sophisticated and advanced. You know what I mean? So, uh, so, 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 so before I go into like all the different guns and the history of them and how they came down to, through time. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you, like, how do, how do you think the world would have been different if, if the Chinese never invented the gunpowder? You know what I'm trying to say? Oh, like, no, I was actually kind of thinking about that. Because like, like, yeah, you would, would be, be using more to, you know, not sticks and stones, but um, knives and, and spears. I mean, because yeah. if they didn't... Um, I'm guessing... The idea of making something that would project mm -hmm. so that you could take out more people from a distance would always be, uh, right. you know, bow and arrows, of course. But, yeah, it would have been different because your tactics are obviously is different when you're using guns. And at yeah. that time, and your enemy is not using guns. Mm -hmm. You're easily wiping out people, even though it could yeah. take a minute. You still, you know, you right. you got a combination of people who are right. with guns behind you or in front of you, and you're doing something else. Right. So. How yeah, would, it would the world say. be different, man? That's that's the thing that trips me out. Yeah. Would, I mean, when you think about it, when when the when the settlers came and they Christopher Columbus and everyone else who came to colonize, mm -hmm. if they didn't have guns, what would they have done? They might not have made it because I'm sure you know tribes say? would have been here. Yeah. Like, remember, well, did we do um, our discussion? Like, um, yeah, when you had slavery or whatever, and you kind of mentioned how many slaves land, landed in different mm -hmm. locations. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there would have been more indigenous uh, Native Americans here. Yeah. So they would have been able to easily oh, outtake yeah. out any helped, settlements because yeah. they would have, you know, all they had to do was probably most likely just surround. I mean, yeah, there may have been some that could have held off a, mm -hmm. a tribe or whatever by being in a nice location. But for the most part, you, you they would be um, yeah. in trouble. Yep. I mean, it just really <clears throat> trips me out. Like, how how history would have, you know, what in history would have been different if guns were never created, if gunpowder was never found there? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like... Different. I mean, really, it would have been, maybe it, all these colonies would have never happened. Yep. A lot of... Yep. Mm -hmm. it, it, but, but the thing about it is, isn't it interesting that how something that was found and discovered in one region ended up changing the entire course of history of mankind. That yeah. just just that concept alone, Chris, uh, just, just, guns just and, trips me out. Yeah. Just that one moment of time when they said, Oh, what is this? And they figured out and it sparked and then Yeah, and then it was like Marco oh. Polo started taking it around and then yeah. Oh, what is oh okay, we could use this to do this and you know And what then I mean? someone I mean obviously you kind of said where it was originally for um, 
uh, fireworks and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah, more festive and stuff. First did it, but yeah. yeah, when the person was like, huh, I can use this. And probably something happened, even with um, fireworks, the fact that. You know, you have the kind, um, if you remember Roman candles, yeah, how they yeah, just shoot, shoot out. out. Like, I'm sure just seeing that image made someone go, what if I could put, put something that, shoot that shoots out? out? Yeah. Because I'm sure someone aimed it at someone Man. and hit and then was like, yeah. yeah, if I actually had something else in here. Yeah. Like That's why it made guns. sense why cannons probably were the first ones because right, someone probably cannon, built something. Yeah. You know, it probably took a while to figure out, oh, you need... You this know, the can has got to be this big and this heavy and this material with right. this, you know, because I'm sure, like, again, as uh, some of them things blew up on them. You well, know I, I mean? bet in trial and error and stuff like that. So, you know, what if guns didn't happen? And then I, I will also wonder if if guns didn't happen and gunpowder didn't happen, would we still have the other weaponry and technology like nuclear and this and the atomic bomb? And I kind of want to say I doubt it. You know like, what I mean? If you never get that far why would you want to build you know that An atomic bomb and all those other th- weapons of like that what but how would war be world war one two three if guns were how would things creative? well for that is yeah. mind, it's, <laughs> it's, it's mind-blowing to me just that's, to that's some things you go it's gonna be parallel you know yeah universes to <laughs> that's crazy man anyway so let me <clears throat> let me let me go down the list of, of like the history of all the different guns and when they came to be so we're going to start with Remington Arms. And, I mean, I think I've heard of all of these. Are you going to bring up more about gunpowder? No, yeah. that's just it about so gunpowder. Gun what is gunpowder made of? Did you get that? Yeah, it's this thing. I actually had it, but uh, you guys could look it up. It's okay. something with an S. Sulfite something and some other thing. It's okay. like a couple of chemicals. Okay. So yeah, I was kind of wondering. look it up, though. And I'm kind of going back to your um, the moon thing. Is I w- was thinking to myself what they could have just smelt was sulfur. or right. something, Which... Is the byproduct of of, of shooting a, a gun or yeah. yeah or part of gunpowder? So, but and maybe which is interesting because I have never looked up the composite of what the moon the is made of, moon, yeah. and so if the dust has a lot of sulf- sulfur or sulfuric something. That's what Farrakhan but, said. If you look at the speech, Farrakhan broke it down. I mean, yeah. you know how Farrakhan is. Yeah. He, would, he, would, he, would, he was like, and the moon was once. He's so passionate. It, yeah, <laughs> at China, and it exploded, and that's why gunpowder was found in China. Hmm. Oh, he broke it down. Okay. And the moon shares its water with the earth, and now it continually pulls it. For, you know how he talks. <laughs> that's my Farrakhan impression, y'all. <laughs> I'll watch this on YouTube. That's my Farrakhan yeah. impression. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But if you see him talk about this, and I remember as a young kid, like 20 years old, mm-hmm. Just, fresh out of house to go to college. I was like, what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can you imagine your wow. face when you hear that? You know, so gunpowder is found on the surface of the moon. And he, I mean, he broke it down, yeah. bro. Okay. Yeah. And and was challenging folks. Like, go and look it up for yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so yeah. Yeah, guys. So at home, that, that was actually a good question. Look it up, you know, all of our listeners and see what. You know, gunfighters made. Like I said, I had it. We could look it up real quick too. But anyway, oh, yeah. we, we we're gonna keep going. Uh, so let's start with Reming, Remington Arms. Around the same time, the U.S. government and some states began hiring smaller gun making outfits to produce guns or gun parts based on the weapons being produced at the U.S. armories. Some of the oldest U.S. gun makers got their start then, including Ella Follett. Remington, who began producing flintlock rifles in 1816. Okay, so that was right after uh, 17, the 1790s when the armory began manufacturing the muskets and other guns. Right after that, yeah, 1798 and all that, Remington was not even, not even uh, 18 years after uh, the, the Remington company came out and they started making guns, which you guys have heard of Remington. And then Let's go to Colt 45. In 1836, Samuel Colt received a U.S. patent for a handheld pistol that featured a multi-firing system based on a rotating barrel with multiple chambers that could fire bullets through a lock and spring design. So that's the Colt 45. I don't know if you guys remember the old Colt 45s, the revolvers, yeah. with all the chambers. So, so that, so a guy, Samuel Colt, he received the patent for that, and that's when he came up with the, with the Colt 45. 45 in 1836. Civil War firearms. Once Colt's pat, patent lifted, other companies, including Remington Star, Whitney, 
and Manhattan began manufacturing revolver-type weapons, and the firearm became one of the main sidearms for both the Union and Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. Among the famous manufacturers of the revolver design was Smith & Wesson, whose versions proved faster to discharge and reload. So after Samuel Coe came out with, with his revolver, mm -hmm. the patent was lifted, and other companies came out, and they were able to do it, oh, including sorry. Smith & Wesson. And again, it became the the main firearms of the Union and Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. So everybody had, had a, a revolver. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Okay. It wasn't a code. It was like some I mean, other companies, yeah, okay. made it. Smith & Wesson, Whitney in Manhattan, Remington was able okay. to make it then, and all that stuff. So now we're going to move into, so, so actually we're getting later now, after the Civil War and stuff like that, now, now we're going to move into double-barrel shotguns. Other improvements, including breech-loading systems that allowed the gunner to load the weapon from the rear, rather than having to tamp it down from the gun's muzzle in. Rear loading or breech loading systems developed by gun manufacturers, including Sharps, Manured and Burnside, packed the projectile and powder together in a single combustible cartridge. The system not only saved time, it also avoided exposing gunpowder to wet conditions. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So, so, so that's the double barrel shotgun where the powder and the projectile was in a single cartridge, you would pop the big, yep. the bucks in there, you know what I'm saying, and load them up, click, boom, and you have <laughs> one in one. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it was like, bah, you know, it's crazy, man. Yeah. So, so then after that came the uh, Spencer gun. Okay. The Spencer <clears throat> Repeating Rifle Company patented a design at the start of the Civil War that was capable of repeat, repeated firing following a sim single ammunition load. The Spencer gun a favorite of President Abraham Lincoln mm. loaded multiple cartridges at once by storing them in a magazine at the rear of the gun. Each shot was then fed into the chamber through a manual mechanism. That's interesting. So, so that's that's the first inkling of the the clip. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Someone and said, "Wait a minute." Still somehow. Yeah, someone said, "Wait a minute. We can we do more. We can put a clip in <laughs> and have them all loaded, and then chick click, boom." Click. And so this is before the, you know they made yeah. the clip could just load on its own. So this was the first inkling of it. It's crazy, man. So, so then Browning, I know you guys have heard of Browning. So John Moses Browning, one of the most acclaimed farm designer in history. John Moses Browning of Ogden, Utah, began designing, began designing the New Haven-based Winchester Repeating Arms Company in 1883, and creating a version and created a version of the rifle that incorporated a pump action. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so it went from a cartridge manually loading them to the pump shotgun by by Browning. Where you, where you could load them in and chit chit boom, boom. chit chit boom. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pump or slide action guns fired, fired featured a mechanism where the shooter pulls back a grip on the gun's fire forearm and mm. then pushes it forward to eject the empty shell and reload the gun with a new shell. What, what year was that again? This was uh, 1883. Damn. Browning, however, would become best known for his contributions to automatic loading firearms. Okay, so now let's go to the Gatling gun. Before Browning developed his semi-automatic handguns and machine guns, Indianapolis, Indiana-based Richard Gatling had already created an earlier, more primitive version of the machine gun. In the early 1860s, Gatling received a patent for a hand-cranked, multiple-barrel weapon that could fire 200 rounds per minute. Damn. The Gatlin Damn. gun could fire for as long as the gunner turned the weapon's crank <laughs> and an assistant <laughs> and an assistant for the ammunition. Yeah, yeah I, I saw it in the movies. Yep. It's uh. crazy. Hmm. So <clears throat> Gatling did that. Richard Gatlin. I mean, how many people have died because he created that? He, you he know is. what I'm saying? Yeah. I've seen it on film. They're just cranking. Yep. Like, <laughs> 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 they keep rolling. Like, take it off. And all they the just be feeding it in the person on the side. <laughs> yeah, they're feeding it. Yeah. It's crazy. I know we're laughing, but it's funny when you think about it. Yeah. How this stuff was created, man. So, so, so after Richard Gatlin came out with his Gatlin gun that you guys have seen in many movies and stuff like that, uh, Maxim Gun. Hiram Maxim, an American-born British inventor, would take the machine gun to the next level with his Maxim gun. The weapon harnessed the recoil energy from each bullet 
fire to eject a used cartridge and pull in the next one. Ah, so the Maxim, the, the Maxim machine gun of 1884 could fire a barrage of 600 rounds per minute and would soon arm the British Army and then the Austrian, German, Italian, Swiss, and Russian armies. So Maxim was the first one to develop it with a clip that he used the, the charge from the previous bullet to, to bring, to up to the bring the other to bring the next one up. Wow. And kick it back, then the next one comes, comes up. up. Kick it back. It shoots out, brings... Kiss. Hiram Maxim, Jeez. you mother... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. How many deaths of your invention cause, mm. of your <clears throat> your ingenuity cause, I say? Because it was already out. As you can see, as it time just, went on, people just got smarter about it. And made them... We could do this. We could shoot do that. way more and more. Made them shoot way more and work more efficiently. Yeah. It's crazy. And so so after Maxim did his thing, then the Tommy gun came out. Oh. A generation later, during U.S. conflicts in Nicaragua and Honduras, the advent in 1918 of the lightweight Thompson submachine gun, also known as the Tommy gun, would offer a handheld version of the deadly machine gun as one of the first portable and fully automatic firearms. While the Thompson was developed too late to be used in World War I, its inventor, John Thompson, marketed the gun through his company to law enforcement, but the weapon also found its way mm -hmm. into the hands of criminals whom law enforcement was targeting. And so. the, in the age of prohibition, the Tommy gun became a weapon of choice among gangsters, mm. leading to many of the era's most horrifying crimes, including the infamous Valentine's Day Massacre of February 14, 1929. Ah. And which is the one Al Capone and all yeah. the gangsters used as well back then. And you see the year that came out, 1918. Mm -hmm. So all those gangsters after that, the Tommy gun was the one of choice. So I remember, like, again, movies where you see them standing on the side of the car. Yeah. <laughs> Just with, like, with, with the Tommy gun. And the Tommy gun had yep. the big, I yep. think the circle, the uh -huh. half circle thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. But as you, you you pointed out, yeah, definitely these, each time the new innovative way was not to make it, I don't know, to, to maybe it, it's safer too, but they also were just strictly trying to increase the amount of um, yeah. bullets that could be shot out. Yeah, it's crazy, man. February 14th, which, which <clears throat> is my, my, my birthday, by the way. And I've heard of the Valentine's Day massacre, but I never knew that it was connected to the invention of the Tommy gun. That's crazy, because that happened, what, nine years after the Tommy gun was, was created? 1918, mm. the Valentine's Day massacre was 1929. Yeah. That's nine years. Say it again, 1928? Nin 1918, it had, the massacre happened 18. in 1929. Yeah, it was like nine years later, right? No. No, no. that's um, 12, 12, 11. 11 years later. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, so 1918, a Tommy gun was created. In 1929, the Valentine's Day massacre of February 14th happened. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so now let's move to, to the to the eighteen four to the... AK-47, which was created after the Tommy gun. Among the most significant firearm inventions during the Cold War era was the AK-47 rifle, developed by Mikola Kalashnikov. Uh, how you say that? I, and I've heard this so many times. I knew about that. Mikhail? Mikhail Kalashnikov. Yeah. yeah Mikhail Kalashnikov. Thank you. Sounds me. good. Yeah. <laughs> For the Soviet military in 1947, AK stands for the Automatic by Kalashnikov. Mm. That's what it stands for, the Automatic by Kalashnikov, AK. <laughs> the short barrel weapon with steep front sight post and curved magazine offered the rapid fire of machine guns with lighter weight portability. The deadly, effectness, the, uh, the deadly effectiveness of the Kalashnikov in the Vietnam War led defense forces at the Pentagon to produce a new assault rifle, the AR-15, which became known as the M-16. Hmm. I've shot one of those. So, so as you know, the AK-47 is probably one of the most popular guns within the hip-hop community, yeah. within films. I mean, all of the... I was just watching uh, uh, on uh, Netflix... Uh, what uh what's the the Mexican uh cartels dude's name again? Why am I blanking out? Oh, um uh, <laughs> um not 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 uh not not Pablo Escobar, but the other one. Uh the one in Mexico that that, that they just indicted in New York. 
I just watched this whole Netflix series and I'm blanking out of the guy's yeah. name. Um, the one in Mexico and he killed like three thousand. Anyway, all these all these Mexican uh, <coughs> cartel guys. Mm-hmm. They would have chrome and, and gold plated AR 15s. Wow. Made. It was crazy. And let me interrupt and just kind of um, go back to a thing gunpowder. Mm-hmm. Um, it was. It was invented, of course, by the Chinese. It, originally, the mixture elements are sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, which is potassium nitrate. Right. So I just wanted to. Right, right. I knew it was sulfur. Something. That's what I said. It was yeah. sulfur. Something. I just couldn't remember the other ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the AK-47. Uh, uh, and I don't know why um, I'm blanking out of this. Uh, this guy on Netflix, but I'm going to tell you guys, if you give me one second, because it's bothering me. I don't know why I'm blanking up. I just watched this whole uh, thing. And you said not, not Escobar? Not Escobar and the other dude. The other one, man. El Chapo. Oh, okay. <laughs> there it is, before I even <laughs> sign on. Yeah. El Chapo, guys. That's the one I wanted to say. Yeah, he. I was just watching his Netflix special, and he had him and some of his dudes. They had like gold plated AKs. Oh wow! I mean, all gold AK forty sevens, dude. I'm like, why? And for some reason, and maybe it's the name of the AK why it's so popular. Just because, because just because it sounds cool, AK forty seven. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. It, it does sound it does cool. Sound cool yeah. You know what I'm saying. And it looks cool, yep. and you know, even though it's a, it's a, it's one of those weapons. So anyway. I didn't know that because of the AK came the AR-15. I didn't know that. I knew the AR-15 derived from the M-16, which the AR-15 is supposed to be a more civilian version of the M-16 yeah. for the Army. I knew that. I just didn't know that the idea derived from Americans seeing what the AK-47 did. Yeah, I actually, that. I kind of... I think would the best way to say it is AK-47, or the M-16 was the answer to the AK-47. Right, exactly. That, that I did know. I, I mean, did, I, I didn't that know too. that, yeah, yeah, but that's exactly Again, what it was. from being in the military, so. Right. Yeah. So, so, now <clears throat> let's, so now let's continue with the 21st century, you know. Uh, into the 21st century, modernized version of the fully automatic AK-47 and the M-16, chiefly the M-4 carbine, have dominated U.S. military rifle power. In the civilian world, the AR-15, a semi-automatic version of the M-16, has become popular among gun sport enthusiasts as well as among mass shooters. In Newtown, Connecticut, Las Vegas, Nevada, San Bernardino, California, and Parkland, Florida, where all these mass shootings happen. Yeah. You know, today the term semi-automatic refers to an auto-loading guns that require a trigger pull for every shot fired as opposed to fully automatic weapons which can fire multiple shots for every trigger pull. Both versions of the modern automatic weapon can fire hundreds of bullets per minute and represent a vast leap beyond the nation's earliest guns, such as the flintlock rifles, which have highly skilled gunners only managed to fire three times in one minute. You know? Hmm. So yeah. what is, um, if I could uh, add to it, like having shot, yeah, a you M16. Know, it was yeah. a. It was really, because that's the first weapon I've ever shot, oh, except okay. for like a BB gun. Yeah, you know. And isn't it pretty big though? Let me look at um, what M16 I mean, look like yeah. They're they're same. I guess like a rifle. I don't know. Uh, I've never really thought about the measuring of it yeah. to something else. But my point is, uh, just say how it's interesting how you can take that sucker apart. Oh and yeah, putting it back together. I mean, we oh, you learned that, that um, yeah. you know, in the in the military. Mm-hmm. Um, so it looks just like so it looks just like an AR-15, but it's just a, a fully automatic version. Of yeah, it. you can select um, wow. single. I think a burst and then fully or something like that. Wow, if, if my memory is correct. If I'm wrong. So that was the answer Sorry, to the AR-15. Long time. <laughs> yeah. But I but I have to admit the AR-15 still looks cooler. <laughs> even though I like, you know, what I'm saying? I mean, again, what even I found I interesting like about the M16 is um, having not, again not shot in anything. I remember a person See, um, that. after, and this was after um, people had commented how easy, mm-hmm. like there's no recoil. Mm-hmm. Um, if you got your um, aim and you figure out your groupings and not everything. Like mm-hmm. it's just it's amazing, yeah. It's a really 
<laughs> good weapon. So yeah, I, and I I get how yeah. They, uh, um, look if if you, if, if you look at this, what happened in Atlanta, which which in Atlanta you can you know you can bear arms. So if you so if you look at if you look at how this guy tried to mess with him and his girl, and he actually thought he was getting away. This dude grabbed his AK-47. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Watch. I think this is another. Uh, so let me go back. No, nah, because someone this shoots is at him first, or wait, someone was shooting at him first. You know what I'm saying? And then this dude, yeah, here this guy's in shooting Atlanta caught on. Yeah, this dude was with his girl. His girl was in the car. And this dude ended up. I learned more about this, and this dude ended up getting away. He, he they didn't charge him. Oh, okay. You know, this dude's messing with him. Yeah. And this dude, this dude was like, oh, you want to try something? He, he had his AK in his front seat. Whoo! Yeah, see, he had his AK in the front seat. This dude starts shooting at him. And then this dude had his AK. Okay. That's a woman? Mm hmm. She was shot in the shoulder. Oh, yeah. See? From, yeah. Okay, yeah, I hate yeah, to say it, yeah, but it looks like he shot at, or at the one guy first, no? Well, no, well, it, I, I found out more about the story, and okay. this dude was actually provoking this dude. Mm -hmm. He was in a gas station just getting some gas, and these dudes, these you know, these idiots were there, and they started provoking him. Got it. And he basically just defended himself. He got his gun just in case. Yeah. Now, if you go back, there, there's other better videos of it too. So then he see he was walking out. This dude's like, "Yo, he's like, he's yeah. like, dude, I'm just I'm following him." Like, yeah, hey, he's following him. He's following him. Then the man goes to his car and pulls out an AK. See, he's holding his waist. See? Yeah. Moments later, both start firing shots at one another. Oh, he probably okay. Got it. Yeah. See, he starts shooting at him first. Then this dude just started defending himself. Mm. As the driver's trying to leave, a woman. But the, they have another video of it. They have another video. They probably took it down by now. <clears throat> when the dude ran off, mm -hmm. this dude kept shooting at him. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. With the AK. Okay. But, yeah, but again, <laughs> the, AK, the AK just looks cool. Like yeah. That. I know. Because it's, yeah. it's just the way, it's it's that the handle way top the, part. Yeah, and the banana But that's clip. for, I'll say, yeah, the clip comes out and is the yeah. banana. But the um, top the part F15, that you F15. can hold yeah. is also this, where you aim through and stuff like, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Interesting. So that might make it uh, more accurate. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Anyway, guys, yeah, <laughs> that's our show today, man. That's that's a that's a really cool history of guns and gunpowder. Again, look that stuff up. You know, the information is out there about how the moon was created in China and gunpowder and what the astronauts found and smelled when he went on the moon and stuff. And they all said it was like gunpowder. Uh, I'm sure that video out there of, Car of Farrakhan is somewhere out there of that speech. You can tap into that too and just check uh, some more stuff, man. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Definitely. Subscribe on YouTube channel ISENT Group Digital. If you guys are into CBD, the link is in there for that too. We have a company, CBD Organic Oasis. Uh, thank you for listening on uh, Spotify, Buzzsprout, Stitcher. Google Play, iTunes, all the uh, websites, all the streaming platforms, and, and, and the cell phone apps. We'll probably be on iHeart with this one too soon. I'm going to submit it soon. I was talking to my agent about it this morning. We're going to be submitting the HPR Chronicles to, to iHeart, see if they'll pick it up. That'll be cool too. That will. So, uh, yeah, thanks for checking in, and we will see you guys next week. It's the HPR Chronicles with Shaquan Smith. And before I sign off, I'm so stupid, I didn't do Today in History. <laughs> and I was just and about this, to remind this is you. Why, Chris was about to remind yeah. me, and I probably felt the energy. So it's October 9th, Wednesday, you know, this day in history. I'm sorry, guys. I always... Sometimes I forget we're moving and shaking and uh, on, yeah. So let me give you guys four historical facts real quick uh, on this day in history, October 9th. Let me see. How about this one? Uh, how about this one, Chris? In 1855, Isaac Singer patented the sewing machine motor. Hmm. And we, we live in Southern California, and if you go to Pasadena, 
I visited the Singer Mansion in Pasadena. Actually, I filmed a music video there years ago. Oh, nice. So the Singer Mansion is still there. It's still there. Yeah, in, in Pasadena. So this day in 1855, October 9th, was when Isaac Singer patented the sewing machine. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Let's find some other cool stuff for you guys. Uh, what's the first one? Uh, okay, a group of Spanish missionaries settled in what is now San Francisco in 1776. Hmm. A group of Spanish missionaries settled in what is now San Francisco. October 9th. Uh, what was that? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that was my Google. Thinking I'm asking it something. Uh, oh. Yeah, October 9th, uh, <laughs> 1776. Everybody knows I just came from Spain, so that was interesting. This one? Yeah. So in 1914, October 9th, during World War One, German forces captured Antwerp, Belgium. I that just was, picked it because we were yeah, talking about guns. Talking about war and guns <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, let's do another one. This is California since we're in California. In 1930, October 9th, aviator Laura Ingalls landed in Glendale, California to complete hmm. the first solo transcontinental flight across the u.s by a woman wow so that was today in 1930 october 9th historic. all right guys sorry about that sometimes i forget so yeah anyway it's the hpr chronicles with shaquan smith we'll see you guys next week peace <laughs>